¿Ya? Well done. ¿Ya? So if we could all please sit down, make less noise. Thanks. I'd like to introduce you to our second speaker today, Michele Trimarchi, coming from Italy. Michele is a um, professor of uh, culture, cultural e economics and uh, cultural analysis of law. He writes extensively on uh, cultural policy, um, of policy and cultural economics and uh, works in international cultural cooperation. Um, thank you, Michele, for making it today. Um, he's going to speak about, his talk is uh, from Ivory Towers to the Urban Texture, a map of future culture. Thanks. Yeah, well, first of all, uh, let me justify myself. Uh, I'm an economist, so I'm not the right person to be here. But uh, I, my impression is that what, what I can do, uh, trying to be of any use, is to give the impression of the ecosystem where we are. Whoever you believe you are, an artist, a project leader, a cultural manager, whatever it is, certainly there is a complex ecosystem. And very often the danger is that we um, spend our time with people like we are. So we act, not only we never, or we rarely listen to different voices, but very often we, uh, at, at the end of the story, squeeze our own beliefs thinking that these are the only right ones. So maybe just a wide water view can be of some use. I will start from where we are, just to understand where we possibly are going to. And the point is, okay, the uh, dominating feeling in the present world is that things are going really bad because there is something like barbarians um, threatening our civilization. All the people working in heritage, in culture, in the arts, uh, whatever sector, even in opera, music, uh, dance, etc., normally feel themselves under siege of an ignorant society. They say people now are really losing their culture. And they feel, and they declare a lot of nostalgia uh, towards something like, uh, in the 19th century, everybody used to like opera, which is, of course, not true at all. Now, my um, view is that in present days, we are the most sophisticated society ever in history. So our feelings, our approaches, our expectations are much more sophisticated, much more able to go into depths than it used to be even 50 years ago. So it's bizarre that the fear of change is so strong, so um, deep, that actually the real justification is, okay, people are ignorant. Very often, I. I actually live going around in conferences and debates, etc. And there is at least one or two people saying something like, young people have a very low threshold of attention because they are actually used to change programs in the TV uh, with a remote control, lying on a sofa, not doing any effort. Uh, that's a moralistic view, of course, but I mean, it really is diffused. And then something like, okay, they are used to uh, uh, video games, touch screen, etc. And I always answer saying, okay, the Lord of the Rings is much longer than any symphony by Mahler. So the point is, it's not true that the threshold of attention is low. The fact it depends on what you actually are using and doing. So there are many things that even younger people um, actually are happy to bear because they like it. So the point is not ignorance of people. It's the idea of culture not being anymore a monoblock an objective static monoblock to which we have the effort to go, suffer, etc. In Italy, normally, uh, Italy is full of very bad examples in managing culture. For example, we don't have armchairs in front of paintings in museums because the uh, common place is either you suffer or you can save your soul. And since we believe, uh, 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 it, apparently I'm joking, I'm <laughs> saying dramatically, but it's true. So the point is, at the end of the story, we should actually re- uh, start from scratch because things of this, uh, the accumulation of this commonplace debate is very dangerous because, of course, at the end of the story, it's not only bad atmosphere, but it's also, for example, less money. So you would less uh, spaces, less urban space. So at the end of the story, there is a physical damage and a financial damage to culture, the arts, because very often there is a separation between 
institutional managing uh, the society and art and cultural projects. So it is much more dangerous than we can believe just thinking they're stupid and that's it. They're stupid and they're dangerous as every stupid person. Then of course the point is we have a very nice institutional gate keeping culture as it is as it has been so far. For example, we have the idea of funds being awards. So funds are not used to allow um, the freedom of expression or in some way even variety of projects, but just I like you, I give you money, which is censorship at the end of the story. But every government in our countries, and the PTs, very often also the emerging economies are imitating the so-called advanced countries, which is a danger because they are replicating their cloning systems in which they just uh, give an award to what they personally like, which is not is necessarily cultural. Then, of course, there, is, there are strong barriers against entry. The emerging activities are normally considered something low level, low quality, etc., which is, of course, something you can't demonstrate. Nevertheless, the institutional responses such as this. And then, of course, there are no real incentives. So uh, nobody is really encouraged to invent some cultural project. The idea is either you stay in the mainstream cultural uh, flow, or you are an alien and you're not given the, even a small citizenship in cultural realm, which is really a danger. Uh, also because it's society is losing something in such a way. I'm not backing the idea of being right or wrong, good or bad. It's convenient for society to have a variety of cultural projects because this is like crafting an alphabet and allowing society to choose a variety of paths of development. While if you just drain everything and put everything on a single flow, you are actually losing energies or possibly also um, you're uh, kicking off these um, energies, compelling them to go away, to change sector, to change country, to change galaxy, whatever it is. So it's quite stupid. Um, on the other hand, the defense of culture is uh, to um, protect the ivory tower in which they believe they are still. And the idea is, OK, we are doing something ethical, such as transforming people into wonderful people, which is very stupid. I have a very long blacklist of people I hate that read novels, go in museums, like music. Also, Hitler loved symphonic music. So culture is not changing your soul. But if you read whatever it is, uh, magazines, newspapers, and also uh, sacred uh, textbooks and culture, <coughs> it is very diffuse, the idea of culture doing something special for your soul, which is the very beginning of a disaster at the end of the story. Then, of course, the idea of educating the audience. This is also a very stupid statement. Uh, we are not there with cultural projects to educate anybody. We have an expressive urgency. And at the end of the story, maybe this sounds familiar to people in society, and we can exchange ideas, we can exchange intuitions, but the idea of a, a, a theatrical, say, director educating his own audience is very dictatorial at the end of the story. It's very, you know, superb and uh, stupid. Uh, we're not uh, different from the others. We're normal. If I like it, everybody can like it. Culture is very simple. The idea is maybe in the last two centuries we've refused this simplicity and we tried to make things complicated, not to uh, allow everybody have a normal, familiar access in, to culture. And then the last bit, and that's the economic, the financial bit of it, is the idea of demonstrating that culture generates money. If you digit something like economic impact of culture on Google, uh, a lot of um, pages from uh, town administration in United States, Australia, Canada will come up demonstrating, OK, we spend 100 for culture, but at the end of the story, we managed to make 1,000 circulate. Uh, so we transform the investment in culture in something like nights in hotels, meals in restaurants, uh, parking um, uh, tickets, uh, motorways tickets, etc. Okay, true, but this happens for everything. Even illegal activities produce a big impact on the economy. So it would, would, I wouldn't use as an argument. Also because if I say, look, you, it's right, you fund culture because I may generate 10 times the, your investment, every even small commercial center generates 100 times my investment. So it's very stupid to use an argument that can be very easily reverted against us to say, okay, 
so what? What's the problem? We lose the idea of what cultural and arts project may generate that no other activities can do. So the unfungible impact, which is something much more complex and delicate, but certainly we have the advantage of, of generating, of seeding, and so by fertilizing society with things that no other activity can do. So it's stupid to use this sort of arguments which are not at all uh, demonstrable. Then, of course, this protection of culture, which is dominating the debate in the institutional culture, the um, uh, dominating gener generations, whatever it is, um, um, is generating, of course, a reaction of people. And there are many people saying, okay, at some stage, people will come back to us. It's uh, public budgets, as you know, are being drained progressively because maybe there, were too, there, was, there was too much public expenditure for everything in the last 20 years. So at some stage, of course, we've had the problem of trying not to expand uh, even more our public budgets. It is maybe discussed for hours. It's not our uh, object, so I don't, don't lose time on this. But certainly, I must recall the idea that public budgets are being, in some way, contracted. And certainly, culture is uh, progressively given less money. Um, so many people say, OK, but it's not the right thing. At some stage, they will come back. This is so stupid. Things will, are not going to be anymore like they used to be until yesterday. And that's not an apocalyptic statement. It's an opportunity for us. But fortunately, things are not going to be replicated uh, statically as they used to be in the last 30 or 40 years. Then, of course, on the other hand, there are, in some way, um, action which is on one hand occupation of, of, of spaces, which is very romantic in some way. Uh, I, I'm not in a position to give evaluations of this. I'm just analyzing them. Certainly, there is an urgency of going back to places. So the occupation of places has a strong motivation and has a strong passion in it. The question is that probably uh, quite often occupation is a short-term action. So it, very difficult to imagine that there could be a strategic project also dealing with markets, with society. So normally it is a political act which has very strong, and it, it's necessary to put some, something strong in the debate, but the question is, okay, how long can it last and how much can we do um, continuing a simple occupation and not a strategy, a much more, a much wider strategy. On the other hand, there is a very commercial drive such as, okay, we put Disney things, whatever it is, restaurants, bookshops, etc., wherever, whatever it is, culture, we don't make money because people are prepared to do something for us, even donating, but we make money because we actually use something like, we spect spectacularize culture, so we put something, special effects. Um, in Italy, we've had a lot of impressionist uh, exhibitions, a blockbuster exhibition, where people go, look, go away, and never come back. So this is very stupid. It's one, one shot business for one person, and society is not affected at all by this. So it's dangerous to be careful about numbers. I don't care about what, how many people come. My question should be how many people come back when once they've been once in my place, in, my, in the place where I, I'm developing a project. Um, on the other hand, um, in this protected ecosystem, there is a wonderful elsewhere where th things are happening. So I'm, I'm seeing in, in the whole world there are non-mainstream activities developing which are in some way crafting their own projects, not replicating the common uh, you know, uh, making foundations or whatever it is. So there is also a, an institutional grid that normally is cut and pasted to uh, feel protected. Um, actually, what's happening is that many small but strong uh, projects are emerging out of this mainstream culture. And this is the interesting bit. Of course, I'm not saying that each single project will be successful. I'm saying this is a signal of a big attempt in which crafting a project without making reference to the existing models is the clever thing to do. And maybe it is also, uh, it's possible that these projects have a longer life, also because they can be adapted 
time by time and not being in some way mummified. So <clears throat> there is something we're losing, uh, but there is something we're earning, and maybe what we're going to earn in a long-term perspective is going to be much more interesting than what we are losing. So on the other hand, the point is uh, dealing with heritage and the arts and dealing with a word in which the, this part, I, I just um, uh, got my uh, bit from the discussion uh, a few minutes ago, the idea of having too many labels is very dangerous because actually culture, institutional culture, is very obsessed with the idea of being labeled in some way. So also the, being admitted in the UNESCO list is not granting you anything at all. You need to invest in any case, so you only have a label, and this is not at all even attracting tourists or whatever it is. So you remain exactly as you were before. The only thing is you have more formal responsibilities, but nobody actually looks at the strategy of your projects connecting your thing, heritage, whatever, even intangible heritage, with society. So establishing a relationship between culture and society. Culture um, is a very elementary word coming from the etymological root of cultivation. To cultivate, you need two elements. One is a relationship. You need a seed and soil. Only with a seed you can't cultivate. Culture, 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 is normally isolated. So it's strange because they are refusing the funding root of their identity. The second element is the multiplication of value. Nobody would plant a seed to get, after six months, the same seed. You need something more. So culture means not only relationship, but also action. You need some strategy to set a dialogue with people, whoever they are, one by one, not necessarily masses, but certainly it is a delicate but important process. If you don't do it, it's not culture. So whatever label you may have, it doesn't mean anything at all. Just to be quite bad, if we read um, statistics about, for example, reading, you say, OK, in Germany, there are uh, such percent proportion of people are reading at least one book. It's not true at all. It's the percentage, the proportion of people buying a book, not reading it. A. B. Nobody asks you actually what you read. It may be uh, the, uh, I don't know, uh, the man without quality, or it can be also a manual of yoga breathing or a cookbook, whatever it is. I, may, I maybe I can defend the idea that not necessarily every book has the same cultural weight. And maybe the question should be not only if you read it, but how you read it, if you read it again if you look for other books after you've read it, if you write something, etc. So maybe if we look at figures, we don't have any view of what is really happening in society. This is really dangerous because we are, uh, we, we people involved in cultural projects, are the only ones who can protect ourselves from this mainstream dominating strong view of everything being dimensional, which is really dangerous. So even our label may be something nice to use in newspapers, but certainly it doesn't grant us that, that our identity is um, appropriately perceived by society. And so we, very often we have a very loose identity and a very strong label. We should revert exactly the process to be, uh, I mean, in our in, to act in our interest. And um, so, of course, it's true. We are in a crisis. Just to go back to words, crisis means change in ancient Greek. So it's not a bad word, it's just a change. When there is a change, something happens. Maybe none of us will be in the same position as we are now. But only those who are afraid of losing something will react against the crisis. Those who want to bet, want to face the challenge, are quite happy that there is a crisis. Finally, there is a crisis. Things are changing. So it's good news if we only are able to interpret them in a positive way. And certainly, uh, um, without setting hierarchies, but cultural people should be those who are most able of the rest of the world to evolve, to imagine. Because we have contents which are in some way uh, critical are a discourse like the Anglo-Saxon literature 
describes culture is the cultural discourse or the cultural text, which is not something sculpted on marble, but something evolving time by time. But, that's good news, since culture is regulated in a very rigid way, we have a lot of loopholes and open areas in which we can go. The emerging um, projects I was speaking about a few minutes ago are exactly those using the non-institutional area in which you can go. So um, our uh, legal systems are something like whatever is not prohibited is allowed. So rather than fitting, making the effort of fitting into legislation, we should observe what is ignored by legislation and go into that, which is not being illegal, it's just not being mainstream and being free, flexible, and possibly much quicker than the institutional culture. That's our challenge, in my view. Then, of course, new values. Uh, we've been growing up, uh, can I go on? I've uh, been too long. You, you tell me. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, we've been grown up with a very simple idea. Values when we were children, values uh, and still now, the values were something like uh, efficiency, competition, excellence. These were the, the three magic words we've been trained. Our parents would say, you need to be efficient. You must be competitive. You kill people in advance because they could be your competitor eventually, etc. That is very stupid. And it's uh, the manufacturing uh, paradigm at the end of the story. But now, fortunately, the emerging uh, values are, uh, uh, I'm not imagining things, I'm just describing what I see in the world. Of course, these are not yet mainstream values, but they're becoming progressively mainstream values. They are experience, relationship, and proximity, something in which you craft things time by time with a local community, with a place, and with the idea of being flexible, so being um, empirical, which is exactly the contrary to the manufacturing um, paradigm in which everything should be modeled. Very often, uh, cultural people ask me, what's the model? And I always answer, there can't be any model in culture, because by definition, culture is made by, uh, I say culture to be simple, of course, culture, the arts, uh, you imagine whatever thing you want, but certainly culture is not at all homogeneous. It's, by definition, every unit of it is unique and not comparable with each other. So there can't be hierarchy. In, in Italy they say we own uh, two-thirds of the uh, world heritage, etc. It's not anything you can measure. It's so stupid. And it's not a muscular exhibition. The point is how I am managing it. So the point is the new models imply a, a much more relaxed view of time and space. We don't need to be international. We need to be present in our community. So a local dimension is much more preferable and certainly it is much more convenient for us. It will set connection with the rest of the world, but we're not obsessed by our label, whether we are local or international. Maybe if we start locally, we can set a dialogue with the institution much more uh, easily than with uh, world government, with the spectra, etc. Then, of course, this implies the idea of being able to be entrepreneurs, not to be culture as an exception. So normally, the commonplace is cultural people are not people doing business, which is very stupid. If you decrypt the word business uh, out of the you know, mainstream uh, um, commonplace images of the managers, the PowerPoints, whatever it is at the end of the story, business is something, doing something in exchange for. And I must say, even economists used to say, uh, at the very beginning of last century, uh, entrepreneurs are such because they have animal spirits. So they have intuition. They have um, an atmospherical intuition. So it's not computation. It's not Excel sheet. It's just seeing things that no other sees in that moment, even one second before the others, and so have an intuition. Entrepreneur, the word entrepreneur or enterprise, don't focus upon the goal. They focus upon the beginning of something. So the real investment is not something computed with a granted outcome, but it's something you can't do without. So it is an action urgency in some way, and we are there as cultural project people. So 
we are much more entrepreneurs than the Excel, PowerPoint, etc. people that are actually replicating a lazy and a static model. So it's our time. That's, uh, I, I know I may sound encouraging. I'm an economist, still I'm being true. This does not imply that each cultural thing will be successful. This implies that the, the spirit of time is favorable as it never has been before. Um, in the last, uh, say, six months, I've been called a few times by, uh, by uh, companies, by business companies, asking me what's going to happen in the world. And doing this with, <laughs> being sincere, uh, doing this with artists, not, not on my own, but connecting econo economic view, artist intuition, we were actually paid to, to explain to them what's going to go happen in the world. Because they are so much involved in replicated models that they are not any more able to understand what's you know beyond the wall. So uh, also for this, there is a growing demand of art and culture on the part of the rest of the world. It's our task to understand it, to intercept it, and to do something not for them, but to do what we do, understanding what can be of any use for them or for the rest of the world. It's still dialogue of cultural value. Heritage. What's heritage? It's something we've received on one hand, but it's not necessarily. We may interpret heritage from two points of view. Either what we received from our ancestors, there is a commonplace sentence I very often listen to, which is, our fathers did like this, so we need to do like they did, which is very wrong. I mean, we wouldn't have invented the wheel doing what our fathers did, of course. And then, second, in the 19th century paradigm, uh, the idea of um, museums and culture was something like, okay, we are keeping memory of the past because the only, only the past give us value. Forgetting that the past was needed only by the, the capitalist bourgeoisie because it was the only class in history not having a past. They stole it, actually. If you read Mansfield Park by Jane Austen, you see that at some stage, when there is the guy coming from London, he's a, an entrepreneur, a young entrepreneur, he wants to seduce Fanny Price, who is the girl living in an aristocratic family. Uh, he understands that until they are in the park, she is not falling in the trap. So she, he brings her in the wilderness, which is a not organized part of the park. There, Fanny risks to lose her orientation, because, of course, wilderness is the jungle, it's a perfect metaphor for emerging capitalism. We are at the end of the 18th century. At the end of the story, fortunately, Fanny doesn't fall into a trap, because Jane Austen is wonderfully reactionary. <laughs> she wants to rescue the aristocratic people. But certainly, the idea is, at, at the end of the story, that's the metaphor. That's why the bourgeoisie needed the past. When Napoleon goes to Egypt, brings with him more archaeologists and soldiers. The war is a, a very, a, almost a disaster, but they managed to bring in Paris whatever they can, stealing stones from Egypt. That's it. So that's the past. The muses are evolving, fortunately. Mnemosyne, the mother of the muses, who was the goddess of memory, change, is changing her view by 180 degree. Rather than protecting past memory, we need to create something worth remembering in the future. So our task as cultural people is not protecting the existing. I mean, I don't want to destroy it, of course. I, I would say, okay, we protect it, it's beautiful. But our main uh, our, um, core business shouldn't be anymore to protect. Also, the concept of protection implies that we protect things against somebody. The idea of somebody threatening culture. I mean, culture, I, I don't see, apart from exceptions, that happen once in 10 or 20 years, nobody destroys culture voluntarily. So this is a very stupid commonplace. Imagine that people are actually ready to uh, destroy everything. It's not true. We protect it, but our task being heritage people is to create new heritage, something that will be inherited by future generation, that we enjoy it presently, and since we enjoy it, we can transmit some value to future generations. So it's not a good and romantic task. It is an egoistic task. We do it, we enjoy it, we speak our own language. If it's worth memory, it's worth at the end of the story. 
So that's the muses of the future. Uh, a museum, heritage, urban spaces can't be anymore a place where you go and visit like blockbuster tourists, put crosses on your moleskin and say, okay, I've seen it. That's very, you know, it's like anxiety from performance. It's a very stupid concept. It's like uh, a, a very dimensional concept. So it's another opportunity for us, but also a responsibility. So just to be certain, models are in some way reference change. Uh, the manufacturing model is perfectly represented by a symphonic orchestra. Wonderful place, but each single musician belonging to an orchestra must replicate exactly what the conductor imposes. So even if they are wonderful musicians, they can't improvise, they can't interpret, they only have to do exactly the single beat put together by only one person who is the head of the company, in such a case, the conductor of the orchestra. This is Fordism, is a mechanical model, you remember Metropolis, and that's the symphonic orchestra. Now, what's happening is something much more challenging, which is the North African funduk, the courtyard where handicraft people are there, crafting vases, plates, uh, pants, whatever it is, and they craft the objects while they speak with the customer. So the people who want some object speaks with the handicraft person, and this implies that it is crafted in a way which is unique. The next customer will speak differently, even telling stories, and at the end of the story, the object will be different. That's the new economy. It's not uh, utopia, whatever it is. That's happening already. Uh, uh, six months ago, none of you would imagine that you could go at a Nike shop crafting your own shoes. Now you can do it. So even multinational industry understood that personalization is the core of our uh, attention towards objects and whatever that in some way represents ourself. This implies a very big change in the concept of quality. Because quality is, the, the, we go back to the label issue, quality is normally something assessed by experts. I remember when I was a child, uh, we were touring Europe, and the, the touring um, the tourist guides were um, uh, describing everything with a number of stars. There was a church or a building or whatever with three stars, some other with two stars, and the other with one star. If you were in a hurry, you could, couldn't lose at least the three stars things. This is something in which experts assess quality, and quality is just a conventional importance. Maybe it doesn't give me any contribution. The Mona Lisa is a, whatever, 100 million stars painting, is an icon. Everybody says it's culture, it's the arts. Everybody, after having seen Mona Lisa for the first time at the Louvre Museum, goes out and say, but why the hell is it so important? Because, of course, that's, uh, it, each of us in the world, I'm, I'm testing it. Uh, but this is, of course, important because nobody tells anything about Mona Lisa. It's an icon, so you only get there, the, it's beneficial race and become a wonderful person. It's very stupid. It's really ridiculous. So quality is becoming something different, which is not at all connected with the icon, but with the uh, dialogic ability of cultural supply. So it's not Mona Lisa in itself, but it's how it is organized, what it can transmit to me as a visitor, and this implies for every form of art, it's not the thing, but how the thing is in some way framed in something speaking with us in such a way it can tell us something. If it doesn't, of course, we just accept passively that somebody else decided it's important for us, which is not the best destiny we may have. So uh, this is still another responsibility for cultural project people, because we need to understand that the real thing is sufficient, is necessary, but not sufficient. We need a discourse around it. We need to introduce people, we need to encourage them to form their own vocabulary of appreciation. If, it, if they don't do it, they will certainly fall in the trap. Um, <clears throat> how much of time? Have? Okay. So, just to have some guidelines to do uh, um, 
wise uh, art and culture project. We certainly need site-specific identity, which implies the idea not of protecting our identity, but of uh, letting um, the territory, the area in which we are speak, to make a very stupid example, in municipal museums there is never a map close to the works of art exhibited. Maybe municipal museums exhibit objects, stories belonging to the territory. It could be very nice for me as a visitor to watch a map, which is zero cost of course, with a red dot giving me the, that, the information about where this thing is in the urban setting, etc. So it is telling things that we expect to make a very bad example, uh, I'm not a football fan, but I'm, I'm discovering that uh, since many years ago, uh, football matches are described with statistics now. So even people that in my superficial view are in some way only instinctive, you know, people suffering out of their um, football team, nevertheless they can't appreciate the, t the, the, the match only watching uh, people playing, they need statistics. How many times I passed a ball, I received a ball, what proportion I was in the game, etc. So it's normal for us. Pity only cultural people don't understand this. This is really important. Then, of course, another thing is to be flexible and to dialogue with the rest of the world. Don't be snobbish, because very often communities, companies, even the strongest and hardest things we have in the territory can be interested in a mutual exchange. We shouldn't um, stop our uh, view, our realm, just to other cultural people. That's a danger the cultural people actually fall into, is I only speak with the, my similar animals and not with the other species, which is very stupid, very wrong, because culture, also in the past, culture has been successful only if it was able to speak with the rest of society. Greek tragedies were compulsory for communities, so it was a state duty to go and enjoy Greek tragedies, not you didn't pay a ticket and you were, it's like military service. <laughs> so, it would be nice. And the other story, if the question is, okay, what, what can we establish as a dialogue between the arts and heritage? The pity is that in the past we've been very often um, invested with things such as special effects, such as the exhibition of contemporary art in our archaeological site. That risks to be a special effect. The point is, have you got the opportunity to set a dialogue, so to have a permeability between whatever cultural project and the existing heritage and the urban texture? If you do, that's winning perspective because it speaks normally with people with what we see every day. So I would say, of course there is a dialogue, there's no separation between the arts and, dialogue, and, and um, heritage. The, transmitting the same kind of urgencies, values, etc. But we need to be, uh, to, uh, uh, to protect or to be in some way, to, to grant their reciprocal identity, not to spoil any identity. Very often special effects in you know, rock concerts in the Arena di Verona are not bad or good, but it's just a place. It could be also whatever place in the world. So what's the contribution of such a wide place gives to a concert? None. So maybe we can do it uh, uh, whenever else doesn't make any change. We have a, a, a nice example. It's just an example, and I told you before, Italy is not a good place for good examples. Normally, we very... Um, chauvinist and wrong in managing culture. Matera was a municipality uh, having, it's crafted in stone, it's called Isassi, the stones is actually the residence of people. Uh, nevertheless, they understood that they could push it ahead and ahead, doing something respectful of the identity of the existing heritage which come from prehistoric ages. They had a lot of motion pictures of Pasolini, but also Mel Gibson, the passion was actually should there in Matera. And they understood that they can have a um, mixing evolution of the stone culture 
not only with handicraft, but also with uh, artistic sculpture. They have a museum, National Museum of Contemporary Sculpture, showing how the language of the stone is continuous. There is no special effect. And in such a case, whatever you do, you're not going anymore there to visit an old place, but you understand the whole place, and you interp may interpret effectively every bit through an interpretation of the rest. This is quite important because also tourism is becoming something soft with people who want to be embedded in the living community rather than going there in a five-star hotel and being in some way remaining stranger to the community. So we can bet and there is there are a lot of opportunities to uh, connect heritage with the arts without spoiling anything and even strengthening the original identity and strengthening the perspective identity so we actually the importance is to reconquer the urban greed using a lot of examples uh, i make a very elementary example there is a, um, a public library in the netherlands who actually invaded the urban space with uh, digital totems. You can download a book with your ebook reader or iPad for free from these totems. They're far from the library. When you go, get to page, say, 50, they put the 51, there is a map of the library. They say, OK, if you want to read the rest, you come to the library. And you can download the rest for free, but you need to come there. Now, the question is, if there is something happening in the library, then nice, because I'm capturing you. If there is just a static place where they allow you to download the book, you lost your bet. So the point is to be active, but to do it with a wide view, using the whole urban space and catching people where they are, rather than expecting that they will come, make the effort to come in our place, etc. So, uh, and also the idea of using cross mediality. Um, I would like to visit a museum and to watch a painting while I listen to the voice of somebody reading the letter that the painter was writing while he was painting. So to have information like statistics for football is very elementary. We can do it. So these are our challenges to set alliances, not to be, culture can't be in competition. We're so unique. Other cultural things are not in competition. Normally, people consume the whole system. So I'm lucky if there are other cultural things in my place, because at some stage, people going in other places will come in my. So the real mistake is to feel in competition with culture. We should set alliance. At least we can also ignore the other, but certainly not be uh, um, obsessed by the idea that other people can spoil our destiny, our, our uh, projects. And then uh, avoid the idea of considering public authorities static and uh, immovable. We go and negotiate. We need to ask, not to ask for money, but to say, we want these things. Think about how many things you may obtain in kind. Spaces, technology, training, whatever it is. At the end of the story, uh, your goal is not to get a lot of money, but to reduce the amount of money you need to get things, objects, places, whatever it is, endorsement that can be much more powerful than money in a stage of launching some product. Uh, and then, of course, the idea of not being afraid of the of digital world as something spectacular. Virtual museums are not the same museum seen in a, uh, a program on the, it is another thing. So uh, there is no separation between the digital world and the, digit and the analogic world. The world is only one. We can use two dimensions. So it is clever to exploit the opportunities of a dialogue between analogic and digital rather than being too much drained against the idea of thinking digital is superficial. It's not at all. So we've had fire. I'm finishing. Be safe. Feel safe. We have the fire, but we must use it. So we need to reconquer the urban space. All the, all the festivals occurring in these years are a nice symptom. Maybe some of them will finish at some stage. They are a symptom that we don't want urban space to be uh, to belong to other people to, or to nothing, possibly. If you draw the map of your movements every day, uh, like home, a coffee bar, some friend's place, university, whatever it is, uh, normally culture is out of your everyday path. You make a deviation to go into a theater or a museum, etc. You don't, never fall into to be 
extremely stupid, the model should be something like a cultural Starbucks, a place where people do every effort to keep you there, not your soul, to keep your body there. Whatever you drink, whatever you do, you're there. That's a challenge, to open a very big area of permeability between the place where we do something cultural and the rest of the town, the rest of the urban grid. There we can actually win up, but because many people will fall into, not into a trap, but into the place. And so, if they like it, they can do it. This is really important, so not to be in some way uh, to keep our identity protecting it from anybody. That's it. Oh. Thank you, Michele, for this stimulating lecture. Um, are there any questions? Hi. Um, thank you for uh, your uh, evocative, but rather black and white presentation, I would say. Uh, I was missing more examples of the good work that's being done, even in Italy. I have to say that having visited many cultural entrepreneurs, uh, they're much more creative about uh, changing their paradigm than, uh, than, than I see uh, in, uh, with, with a lot of operators in Holland or here in Germany. Um, I want to maybe ask you a question about uh, uh, changing the, 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 the idea of time and space, where you said uh, culture operate or culture organizations or whoever is active should maybe focus more on, on uh, what's happening in their locality and, and not so much on what's happening on a, on a global level, if I understood correctly. Does that mean that you cancel out uh, uh, the, the need for interconnectedness and the need for bringing in people from outside? Uh, and the need for being able to also be uh, a global citizen or uh, a uh, being part of a global culture? No, not at all. I make a very elementary. When, when they founded Rome, the, uh, the kingdom of Rome at the very beginning, it was 70, uh, 700 something before Christ, uh, they built two temples. The first was Jupiter. The second temple was the goddess Xenia, who was the goddess of welcome. So the idea was everybody living here is a Roman citizen. They started to understand, we're speaking about many, many years ago, they understood that only hybridating their own even biological root, but certainly cultural root, they could produce something that would become eventually a republic and an empire. So it was refusing the idea of keeping their own identity, uh, I mean, to be very stupid, if anybody kisses for generations with relatives, after three generations, some stupid child comes out. So the idea of keeping our own root is very stupid. So I'm not backing the idea of um, ignoring. I'm, I think that now we can do it digi also digitally, so connections are quite important. My only um, worry is not to be, um, how can I say, to be decryptable. So my project should be something you can read. This does not imply that you accept it passively or that we don't mix together different views. But certainly I need to put something on the table. You need to put something else on the table. We can fertilize with each other. But certainly if before exchanges we don't have an identity, we risk to copy and paste from any other model. So I've seen, of course, you're right, Italy is a place, is a hostile ecosystem, so we have a lot of wonderful good examples and also a lot of bad, bad examples. And the idea is very often we are too much um, obsessed by the idea of doing something international. I mean, just to make a very elementary example, the Impressionist exhibition in Brescia or in Treviso in Italy is not at all connected with the territory. People go there, ignore the place, they don't visit the town, don't, sp don't even buy a sandwich in the town, they go back by coach. So the point is, okay, who is the real uh, beneficiary of this idea? It's just the organizer. So very often in this uh, superficially globalized cultural thing, the idea is that, for example, there is a very bad income distribution. The point would be to involve the whole community, not to do something protected, but to do something which is language, not necessarily only of the place, but 
in some way specific place, specific language, and then of course being able to connect this language because there are, I'm, I'm working in Rome on the river Tiber and we are trying to set of course a lot of um, relationship with other river towns in the world because maybe that we have common or different problems but certainly to check the views of each river town is quite important for us but certainly we are not going to copy and paste any project done in another river we're trying to make a project emerge from the Tiber I don't know if I'm answering. Uh, I'm Not completely. Maybe to give you a counterexample, you must be familiar with the Teatro Valle uh, in, in Rome and, and uh, what's happened there in the past three years, the Teatro Valle Occupato. The Teatro Valle, Valle is, a, yeah. is, a, is one of the oldest theaters in Rome. Um, the city was no longer able to pay for uh, its upkeep and, and renovation, and uh, it was threatened to maybe be demolished. The neighborhood thought differently and decided to move in. Uh, there's now uh, an artist collective who run uh, a manifold of very interesting projects, uh, but they've been fighting with the municipality uh, now already for two, three years. They are in a, a big, uh, 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 sorry, they're talking to, to big name lawyers, etc., etc. Then last year, what happened is that the European Culture Foundation decided to give an award to the Teatro Valle Ocupato to explain that this was actually a quite an interesting way of dealing with cultural heritage uh, and at the same time uh, activate community participation. Only after that happened, uh, a dialogue uh, uh, took place between the municipality and the people that represent the teatro. So I don't see how uh, uh, that could have happened uh, without international recognition of what's happening on the ground. Yeah, but, but I, I totally agree with you. I, I, maybe I explained myself badly, but I'm not against the idea of being um, a internationally connected uh, or get some recognition. I, my site specificity idea is not that of being local and to avoid contacts. Is to I mean Tetra Valle has an advantage because on one hand it hosts. Uh, not only shows but also uh, dialogue, discussion, debates from all the many parts of the world and they were able to bring in Rome a lot of um, people, I think about the Syrian for example, people having problems and giving them a stage and um, an outcome and a discussion which was okay but they at the same time this was devoted not to nobody or only to elite people etc but to people resident in Rome or to tourists so to people using the space. I am trying to uh, demonstrate that you need to connect the two parts so that our community is much more internationally oriented that we can believe. The idea is that we normally fall into the mistake of thinking the locals are locals and international means something else. This is not anymore true. So I'm being quite relaxed about this because I believe that being in a place you are dealing with a community which is not a community of local stupid folkloric people. It's a I, I said, it's the first thing I said, we're very sophisticated, we're very internationally oriented, so it is the right moment to do this. I'm just saying, um, I wasn't thinking about Teatro Valle, I was thinking about uh, three tenors, uh, concert, impressionist exhibition, all the blockbuster things. I think that these blockbuster things tend to imitate something like people coming out in TV in all the world, but not speaking with anybody in the community, not even producing people, not even creative artists. So this is bad. I, I'm backing the idea of involving the widest area that I can, both locally and internationally, but doing it consistently. What I've seen in Italy, living there, maybe I, I'm much more obsessed with bad examples than uh, a visitor can. If there are too many things totally ignoring people and totally dealing with... Uh, when I met the mayor of Brescia after the Impressionist exhibition, the only thing he did was to show me the number of pages of newspapers speaking about the exhibitions. So he didn't care about people, about his town. He cared about press. I am just suggesting that caring only about press is just a, something like a backward activity. It's not necessarily convenient for any cultural project. So I agree with you, totally. There are many bad examples doing something different. 
Another question? Um, thanks. I, I really enjoyed your, your uh, economic approach because um, it's that kind of reality check that I think when we're all forming and constructing projects and talking with um, horrible words, stakeholders out there, whether they work for government or their private businesses and everything, you have to have that head on about you know, basically what's in it uh, for them and also how will it work. Anyway, I, I, I really enjoyed your presentation, thank you. And I'm sorry that more people um, who I've talked to over the last few days weren't here to hear it. I want to ask you about Matera though. You didn't, uh, you said, um, you gave a list of things about what it was but I wonder if you have some examples about how they actually um, fulfilled those kinds of things in Matera. You know, um, Matera, Matera yeah. the, the, the stone place. Uh, what did they do? You know, uh, did they have people to stay there in these houses? Did they, uh, I don't know, but what were some of the things that they actually did? They only, they're very simple, match to um, establish even 20 years ago. Uh, an evolving dialogue between asymmetrical organizations. So there was a private foundation, uh. the administration, the Chamber of Commerce, and being a small place, everybody were actually, they were possibly being schooled together or something like this, which is easy in a local sure. place, in a sure. small place. Yeah. They could trust reciprocally. Yeah. And the other story, they didn't care about being different from the institutional point of view. They started thinking about what to do. So everything was in some way open doors and discussions were about what are we going to do. Well normally in many cases we have um, reluctant organizations who don't want to be involved in uh, very often in, with cultural projects. The, the, the first thing a public administrator says is we have no money. Mm -hmm. so, even before, yeah, yeah. even before understanding what you're yeah. going to speak about, they yeah, say yeah. we don't have money, etc. Yeah. So they this. were able to um, establish a smooth and subtle discussion about what to do, and they could in a long time. So it was not immediate, but it was growing and growing and growing, respecting the idea of um, not setting special effects in the historical center, mm -hmm. but for example, having incentive for small growing um, small companies possibly activated by young professionals mm -hmm. to establish at a very low cost in the center so they could actually open some, uh, not necessarily touristic, but also handicraft, ah, etc. Okay. To make it so living. Everything was, yeah, everything was okay. to consider the historical center as uh -uh. something where everybody could uh -uh. live and act okay. without being special, which is something that normally doesn't happen yeah, yeah. in, at least in the Italian experience. Yeah. So there was, uh, in some way, an anticipation of a smoother paradigm in which there can be cooperation. Of course, cooperation implies discussion, mm -hmm. implies possibly uh, divergence or whatever it is, but at the end of the story they were able to speak, speak, speak and understand and they did things. Now they have, for example, a different setting even of um, hospitality for tourists, which are tourists coming from Italy and from abroad, yeah. which is not the big hotel everybody would have yeah, done yeah. in other time, yeah, yeah. but small rooms in, yeah. in the normal buildings there. Yeah. So it is uh, it. Uh, in some ways sustainable yeah. financially. Yeah. It is generating um, action, goods and services, speaking about the place, so nothing uh, special or alien or whatever it is. Mm. And it does, uh, in some way, attract people from the place who can work yeah. and also people from other places who can come there. Yeah. That's it. So yeah, yeah. it is working like yeah. this. Of course, there is. Thank you. Uh, even an international orientation because it has been used as a location for many motion pictures. Yeah. So there uh, have been a lot of relationship, but they work at the end of the story. So far, hopefully they do. Great, thank you very much. Um, I think we're perfectly um, on time, on schedule. Um, we can start, we'll have a lunch break now from um, 12 to 1. Um, and uh, the lunch is going to be downstairs same as yesterday. Um, we're then going to come back up for the seminars. Um, there has been the, here in the main hall, we'll have the seminar on storytelling uh, with Anna O'Dowd and Jasmine Koch. Downstairs in the basement, we'll have um, Manuel Sanchez and Refunk. And um, subheritage will happen in the workshop hall. Um,
Alterazioni video uh, is not able to come today, but um, Pablo and Emil will um, make it anyway. We'll give their presentations and we're going to have the seminar there. Um, okay, thank you and good lunch.